Hi, welcome to the Divine Insight Show. I'm Travis Taylor, your host. Thank you so much for joining and listening in today or watching. Today, I'm joined by two wonderful guests, Christina Reeves and Demetrios Spanos, who I'm thrilled to introduce in just a second here. Christina Reeves is a holistic life coach and energy psychologist, accomplished author, speaker, and facilitator. She offers clinics, trainings, workshops, seminars, and lectures in North America and internationally. And Demetrios co-founded the Udemonia Center, excuse me, with Christina, and it's a learning center for transformational change, core healing, and personal development. Uh, Dimitri is a certified practitioner of Six Seconds EQ and certified in heart initiation, and they're going to be joining me today to talk about their most recent book, The Mind is the Map, Awareness is the Compass, and Emotional Intelligence is the Key to Living Mindfully from the Heart. Christina and Dimitri, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. And uh, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for this incredible work. And I just want to dive in. Um, what was it that inspired the book at this time? Let's start with Christina, then Dimitri. Well, we have been friends on Facebook. That's how we met for more than five years. And uh, Dimitri was writing some pretty in-depth topics. And uh, I was responding. And things were going back and forth and all of our friends, mutual friends were watching all of this activity for a few years. And I said, you guys really need to write a book together. So we laughed it off at first and then, right. you know, they kept saying, no, really, really, you need to write a book together. So we decided to do just that. Dimitri lives in New York and I'm in Canada and papers were flying back and forth and back and forth <laughs> across the wires and we did come up with a book. Wonderful. And two of the main sort of uh, uh, ingredients that uh, put Christina and I together was empathy and love. Uh, we both love human life. We both uh, want to see people happy, uh, our friends, our relatives, people around. And, and, and empathy was something that we both have deep in our heart and we wanted to share it, mm. united and share it with others. So these were the two <laughs> ingredients that came along with the writing this book. Mm -hmm. At one point, we thought we were done. We had a publisher. Dimitri flew up to Canada. We met with the publisher. We went over everything. They were ready to publish. And we looked at each other, and it was just a thin little book like this. We go, I don't think we're done yet. <laughs> and uh, so we decided to go back to the drawing board. And uh, we did. And the book was actually released uh, last October. Wonderful. Well, congratulations. And it was such a thrill to read it and to dive into it because I know that it's, it's talking about subjects that people really struggle with uh, right now in particular. And, and in the first part of your book, you talk about becoming aware of patterns. And I know that so many people get stuck maybe in a relationship that they, that they keep finding themselves in. It's a, maybe it's a different person, but it's exactly the same type of relationship or maybe a job, um, a cycle that they that they seem stuck in or or an addiction cycle even and in clients that I've worked with people can even be stuck in an in an emotional pattern or a brain lock a belief system pattern and so um, I, I would love to hear a little bit more about how you've identified the kinds of patterns that you talk about that most people might be most commonly stuck in and what kinds of things might come up in their lives that demonstrate that stuckness exactly uh, thank you so much uh, for this great question. Well, uh, in order to answer this question, we might have to go back 10,000 years. 10,000 years, people uh, were out there and uh, they were basically running up and down in order to survive. They would go out and hunt animals. Animals would hunt people. So people would run up and down the trees in order to sleep in the night so they will not be eaten by the animals. Since then, and for the last 10,000 years, we developed something called the fight or flight, which means mm -hmm. you're either going to fight with somebody or you're going to fly away. And that has been built in the human mind for over 10,000 years. So if you take that particular aspect and you build it into patterns, we have great patterns, but we have patterns that are not so great. And mm -hmm. all these patterns have in been built inside the human mind what we call the template and we've been following the ancestors template for many many years and it's very hard to eliminate those patterns unless you really start looking at them unless you start asking penetrating questions and unless you're able to 
look at something we call the writing on the wall, which is almost like a, a beautiful garden with flowers, but also weeds. And sometimes the weeds would choke those flowers and make them die. So this is what we call habitual patterns. It's, it's, we leave them every day. We, the patterns are connected to thoughts and thoughts connected to feelings and feelings connect to perceptions and beliefs. So we use those patterns to So that's what we call habitual patterns. You made a great point, Travis, you know, you can jump all over the place and try to run away, but you can't run away from yourself. You will always take- Common yourself. denominator, right here. <laughs> right. You will always take yourself with you. So that kind of answers the question, why do we do what we do and why do we keep doing that? Until these patterns are looked at and examined, we didn't write them on our wall, could have been culture, could have been religion, could have been our parents, our grandparents, uh, teachers. Usually these, these patterns were written on our wall and created a personality for us from the ages of zero to seven years old. Everything and every pattern we have can be traced back to something that happened. That formed our database. Yeah, thank you. And as I think the video cut out just very briefly, what I thought I heard you say is a lot of these are formed at the ages of zero to seven. And, and a lot of things that happen in our adult lives can be um, kind of sourced back to the types of patterning yeah. and da database that you talked about. Um, so thank you so, so much. And I was thinking about those who might be struggling in forms of various forms of addiction and how that can show up in their lives and and we might uh, you know as a, as a former active um, addict alcoholic myself you know there were there were many times when I could experience exactly what you were talking about you know the the, the brain wants wants comfort it wants ease and then when you're when you're as you call it, triggered or cued you know you're cued up environmentally or experientially and your brain just goes right to that thing that seems to have made that go away in the past, but it isn't the thing that you really want. And so I love that. Um, and so uh, you've actually answered sort of my next, my next question, which was about how it is that we can't think our way out of behaviors uh, that we want to change that are rooted in our subconscious, because as you've described it, it's just there. But is there anything there actually, you want to add to that? Yeah. There's actually two things that are happening there uh, with people with addictions and you know habits that they really want to break. Number one is the mind stuff. Travis, number two is the body itself. The body will, the mind will create what it needs to create so the body gets satisfied. Mm. So in other words, you will create experiences for yourself that the body wants its fix, a different set of chemicals flow through mm -hmm. our, you know, spinal column, you know, it could be endorphins, it could be dopamine, it could be whatever it is, but mm -hmm. the body is going to try with the ego to get it fixed. So you have two things going on with addiction, you know, you have the, the mind stuff, but you also have the physical body that is getting so anxious that it's sending messages to the mind so the mind is going off in a different direction to try to get the body it's fixed so mm. it's a very very difficult pattern to break and congratulations you know i've yeah, worked with a lot you. of people on yeah. that path yeah. i would like to add something to this and between the body and the mind there is what we call in the book the inner voice the critical voice mm -hmm. there is boys that we speak to 24 out of seven is our best friend and our best enemy our worst friend our worst ally but what happens is that inner voice and that's why i mentioned the earlier metaphor about the dentist it, it, it sometimes becomes like a cavity or it becomes like a weed in a beautiful garden so if we imagine that we are coming to this world as a beautiful flower and we want to grow up and, and find our true potential. And all of a sudden we have weeds around that surround us and they choke us, we can't grow up. And that's what the inner voice comes in if we're not attentive. The inner voice acts almost like a, that little pipeline from the unconscious, 
that comes into conscious and if it's clogged or it hasn't been maintained, then all of a sudden we get a lot of feedback from this area and all our decisions are based on the old programming. So we need to be very aware of what we call the writing on the wall. The writing of the wall is like this beautiful garden that has to be maintained and that's where we're gonna dwell and get all our thoughts, our beliefs, our emotions. So we need to be very mindful of our inner voice and the writing on our wall. Right, thank you. And I was also very um, interested in one of the aspects that you discussed as so important to um, uh, folks' understanding and awareness of, of either their, their, their patterns or what they get stuck in and how to, how to move away from that is you talked about um, how our growth is, is so intertwined with others. Um, can you talk about the Im importance and benefit of connecting with others? Because um, I'd love to share that with those who are tuning in. Connecting, thanks, Dimitri. Connecting with others is an important part of our healing. Um, we often feel shame and we often feel blame and we, our worst critic is ourself. You know, we mm -hmm. feel judgment towards ourselves. Sharing our experiences with others and talking through them helps us to understand we're not alone on this path. <laughs> there are many, we never see ourselves, I guess what I'm saying is others see us. Mm -hmm, right. When I work with someone, uh, Travis, I see the soul, you know, I'm working with the soul of the individual themselves as someone who's made a lot of mistakes or had a lot of failures and you know has a lot of patterns that they can't fix and I see themselves as people do what people do based on the writing on the wall you know so opening up and sharing ourselves with others allows others to feel our feelings we get a different kind of feedback from other people than we do from the nonsense that goes on in our own head we get a lot of love from them we get a lot of compassion that we're not able to give ourselves because we're standing in our own way right one of the most important things to just supplement christina's thought is active listening a lot of times in our life our inner voice and our uh, uh, thoughts require that we speak a lot. And we need to learn to become more active listeners. We need to understand when someone is talking, we need to resonate with their thoughts, listen actively, allow them to finish, and then we can express our thoughts. This is a deep understanding of what the other side is trying to say, and that helps their relationship to go on the next level. And understanding just a simple dialogue sometimes can lead to other things in life. So active listening is a, a deep thing and awareness is also our ability to step outside ourselves a lot of times and be able to see things as an observer. Instead of just being active in a conversation, sometimes it makes a lot of sense to step outside the conversation and be able to see it almost like a video, like a movie, and see mm -hmm. how we interact, how we communicate, how we connect, how we're spending our love with everyone else. It automatically gives us a third perspective, which is basically the three parts that we mentioned in the book. How do we be an effective communicator by stepping into awareness? All right, Christina, it sounds like you had a thought as well on that. I did. You know, I, I just, um, <clears throat> a lot of the times in my own personal, you know, problem was wanting to be invisible, you know. Mm -hmm. And when we feel shame and we're blaming ourselves and we're judging ourselves, we have a tendency to withdraw from others, others who can help us. We don't want to reach out because we feel so ashamed. I had this thing in most of my life about being invisible. It came from a rough childhood. You know, if I didn't want to get spanked at home, I made myself invisible. Mm. And then it came uh, more than that, you know, I was a pretty girl and I was getting a lot of attention, the wrong kind of attention that I didn't want. So again, I wanted to feel invisible, not talk about it, just kind of not speak up, you know, not voice my feelings, expressing myself. So I had everything inside of me. 
communicating with others and reaching out to others is one of the biggest healing things we can do for ourselves. The reality of it is, as I said before, there is no shame, no blame, not even to those who wrote on our walls because they too were programmed back through time. So we can come out of the shame and blame game and we can stand up and be authentic and speak what we feel. Others will understand. And I encourage this, this interaction with others. Don't sit alone, share, get out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know that that was an important part of my own recovery in, in addiction and the fear and shame around doing things that, you know, on the one hand are difficult to control, but on the other hand, knowing that it's something that we do to ourselves and then the, the fear and shame around, you know, needing someone to relate to was so important. So I so can resonate with that. And I love your description of these inner voices in your book. And you talked about it a couple of times already on the show as, as the writing on the wall. I, I like to think of the thoughts in our, in my head as like that roommate. I just can't evict, you know, he's going to be, he's going to be in there. So I might as well get to know him pretty well and, and uh, try not to argue with it too much and allow it to have the thoughts, but maybe not engage with it or yell at it or spend all night arguing. Um, but for the purpose of what you're talking about in your work, um, uh, can you uh, elaborate on what you mean by writing on the wall in the context for personal awareness and transformation? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, so uh, I'll use again the metaphor of the garden. And th th imagine that there is a wall out there. And this wall is... It's almost like uh, the, the garden that you were born with. You were born in a beautiful garden. Your parents were there. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, from the age uh, uh, of one to the present moment, there was a lot of people that came around your life, your parents, school, teachers, uh, environment, uh, work. All these people, in some way or another, they literally took a pen and they wrote on that beautiful wall, on that beautiful garden. They planted a seed, they planted a flower. Mm -hmm. And that flower grew up and now you're in the same garden, but within the same flowers, a lot of weeds grow up. There was an experience, for instance, in school when a teacher would yell at you and, and he was demanding respect. And all of a sudden, what did you do? You connected the word respect, the value of respect, with yelling so now next time you and go pilot that particular uh writing on the wall that came from this teacher and it's buried within you in such a degree that it's very difficult to take it out it, it takes a lot of pruning and a lot of other things so the writing of the wall is really an imaginary wall that has a lot of graffiti on it it has a lot of mm. good things it has a lot of prescribed paths. It has your full potential. It has your growth. But in order to get access to it, you're going to have to work with your inner critic and get to that wall, pressure clean it, take out all the graffiti so the wall now can be clean and it can start flourishing again and growing up like a beautiful garden of love. Wonderful. Yes, the, the inner critic that we were just talking about it really, really is helping us and we need to use it before we lose it okay mm. the inner voice is what's going to tell you what's written on your wall listen to the voice write down what the voice says reality check what the voice says is this true for me or is it not true for me remember those who wrote on our wall did so you know in meaningful ways it could have been the culture at the time it could have been society at the time you know someone who grew up during the depression is going to write different things on our wall than we do now where we seek mm -hmm. immediate gratification <laughs> so we need to reality check it all but the wall the writing is going to tell you what's written on the wall now that stuff can be etched in there if it's repeated over and over and over again by a parent that says you're not good enough or you know you're selfish or whatever that can be every time it's said to you it etches a little bit deeper in that wall and then when you come across an experience and as a grown-up and someone says oh you're so selfish you're going to go back to that four-year-old 
mm-hmm. you know, right. and you can't help it. The way that the way that we understand um, quantum mechanics and quantum physics today, not only is the original experience stored on the wall, but it's bundled and it's entangled. So it's bundled with all the emotions that you felt as a four-year-old in that experience. And then on top of that, it's strung together with any childhood conclusions you came up with as a four-year-old. But as an adult, you don't feel that and you don't think that anymore. But the habitual patterns are there because of the biology of the mind and the subconscious works faster than the conscious mind. So what we need to do is use the critical voice to examine what's on the wall and then reality test what's on the wall. Who did that come from? You know, when was the first time I felt that, you know, and is this really true for me? And if it's not, you're 60% of the way to healing, 60% towards healing just by observing it, just by looking at it and accepting that it's there but that's not me and then there are methods that we use to transform the writing on the wall as dimitri said neuroplasticity is a new science of the last 20 years and it tells us in scientific fact that what's written there is not hardwired we can change Mm -hmm. right and when we change there the neural bundles start descent they'll start tearing apart an old neural pathway that isn't being used anymore we're focused on our new belief and our new thoughts not the old ones so we've laid down a new neural pathway and the other one because it's not being used the brain says this is useless nobody's using it anymore and it starts to rip it up and that's neuroplasticity and that's how we change yeah thank you i was loving the writing techniques that you have included in your book um, I always think that that helps us who might be more um, tactile uh, learners or kinesthetic learners. And um, uh, there are so many writing techniques out there as a way for people to process their emotions or experiences, their awareness, their insights, and, and much, much more. And I'm curious about the ones that you utilize, which connect us directly to our own hearts. Uh, Dimitri, I'll start with you. Can you talk about a few of the ones or maybe one that you like personally that you have in your book? Um, the, 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 one of the main tools, and I'm going to start w- with the mind and the relationship to the heart. And you as a boy, is so easily. What happens is this. We start with questions. If you notice on the back of the book, they are 10, 20, 30 questions. So when we say start a journal, I mean, on the back of each chapter. Um, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. pulling it up right now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so it, it's, yes, exactly, exactly. Connecting with others, journaling and asking questions. Our, one of the main questions we ask is, are we here to live a passive life based on the old template, based on the wall, based on this garden that has weeds, or are we here to create a life for our own? And by asking the right question, the next one is why I do what I do and why I keep following the same path. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important to ask questions, not the questions we, we, we supposedly ask. Christina, our own lives, but questions that come up from your own interaction with your own inner voice, with your own world, with your own life. So, by starting with this, the first thing that the inner critic would come in and say, hold it, what are you doing now? You're asking these questions. I'm not comfortable here. I want to start keep judging your life. I want to make sure I keep you where you are. And, and I want to keep your energy low. But by asking these questions now, the inner critic is brought into surface. So now you are inside that pipeline and you can see the wires that bring all this information from the uh, unconscious mind, as Christina described it earlier, there's a lot of information and we don't have the capacity to process it. So the next thing to do is this. We use a lot of visualization techniques and we use the word uh, heart more than 250 times in the book. Mm. And what we really are trying to do is this. The heart has cosmic capacities. While the mind sees in two dimensions, 
the heart is in three dimensions. So by asking the right questions now, we sort of neutralize the inner critic voice, the one that judges and, and creates a lot of misery for us. And we move everything to the heart. It's almost like a sifting. And all of a sudden, the heart with his cosmic capacities takes over and starts now negotiating with the mind. Hold it. You know, you, you following this path. However, now asking these questions, the heart takes over. And unfortunately, for years, we have undervalued the proper uh, capacity of the heart. You know, mm -hmm. philosophers, uh, back and forth, all us that I am, that's I think. And that's the wrong way to go about it because we're not computers. Computers can do a lot of things. However, we have a heart. And, and, and I'm not just talking about the loving heart. I'm talking about the heart that has the capacity to melt strong concepts, has the capacity to come up with bigger ideas and connect to universal principles, not just the lower self. And I don't mean the lower self. I mean the, the way we have a prescribed path. So the book really asks a lot of questions. How do we do this? How do I break down the habits? How do I uh, con move away from the conditioning? How do I uh, become aware of this? The word how is used because ancient uh, Greece, uh, and I, I've spent a lot of studies in ancient Greece, uh, and uh, the old philosopher Socrates always talked about know thyself. So you have to know yourself. You have to know your inner critic. You have to know your voices. And by knowing exactly who is inside of you, now those questions become very useful. So going on a process of self-discovery and journaling, and then what you do is every time you reach a benchmark, you celebrate. You connect with somebody. <laughs> you don't know they are a good thought. Anytime I come up with a great thought, I'll call Christina and say, hey, I came up with this thought. I was doing this, but now I'm doing that. <laughs> You know what I mean? We have this reinforcement between us. So it's, it's a process. It's, it's used on the book for the first six chapters in order to give us exactly the map, the roadmap that the mind works. And the moment we find that roadmap, then we know exactly how to deal with all these things that have been programmed inside of us. So this is a little briefing of how we sort of follow the tools in the book. Thank you. One of my, one of my favorite tools mm -hmm. in the book. Travis is um, it's visualization but it's stepping back into awareness so let's say that you're in an experience okay and you you're not hijacked yet you feel the poke okay the moment mm -hmm. you feel the poke mm -hmm. before you go into overwhelm I ask my clients and my students just take a step back just take one step back and put yourself in awareness. Now take that experience and put it on a whiteboard in front of you. Mm -hmm. There are three parts to every experience. There's you in the experience. There's the experience itself. And then there's the processing of the experience. So when you do that, you're able to get a different perspective. You can see all three parts. When you step back, you do so without judgment, no criticism, instead have a sense of curiosity and awe about what you're witnessing. What you're going to see is going to be very funny and it's an amazing transformation. What you're going to see is you up there, the other up there, both of you are probably triggered, okay? Mm -hmm. So what you're gonna mm -hmm. see is two triggers having an interaction and you're standing back here and it might not even be an important, be your experience you might say to yourself she look what i did oh i poked him oh look i heard him now look how he's responding but it might not even be your experience maybe you need to say this isn't even my experience i need to get out of this suit do you know what i'm saying <laughs> but yeah. see it and get a different perspective one of my favorite tools and it works every time just before you're hijacked you've got to feel that trigger that poke somewhere in your body sometimes you'll feel it in your throat sometimes in your belly you know, it's not a mind thing, but it's a it's a feeling level thing. And immediately step back. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. I, I Did you want to add something, Dimitri? Just a little bit. As we mentioned, there's neural pathways. Imagine that tube that connects the unconscious and the conscious. And every time you do what Christina just said, you big believe out there that the pain that we have 
it's caused by people around us. And that's the, one of the worst beliefs mm -hmm. that we can right. have in our life. Nothing, nothing out there is caused by people outside. The pain is caused by the association, by the meaning we have given to those things. If somebody beeps the horn while I'm driving the car and I start on autopilot and I start screaming and yelling and blaming everybody, the pain that I feel inside of me is not because of that horn, of that action. It's me and my association to that particular instance. So in a sense, if we realize that we are the only ones inside our head and we start rewriting those neural pathways, we become very powerful in life. We have a, a new way to sort of deal with the conscious and conscience and be able to control our inner critic and avoid reacting and feel a lot of pain most of the day. I agree. It's never, ever, ever about out there. 1,000%. As Dimitri said, your thoughts are yours. Your feelings are yours. Your emotions and your behavior are yours. Own it. You're the only one in your head. If you're making, if you feel unhappy, the first place to go is say, gee, I wonder where that came from. What did I do to attract this into my life? What is it that I'm not seeing? What do I need to see about myself? It's all about yourself. It's never, ever about out there. Yeah, I, I appreciate that because it makes me think of a couple of things. I think that um, when we blame, I think it's a form of blame to want to project our own reaction onto other people. And so I think what that does, it also, I was thinking about it as you were describing it, it's a way of disempowering me from being able to change my life because I'm empowering others to dictate to me how I'm gonna feel rather than take ownership and decide that, wow, this experience is happening, I'm a part of it, but I get to choose how to respond to it. And maybe I'll choose the way I responded before and I love your, your idea of like creating that awareness earlier on before we get pulled into that. And I was also caught by what you were saying, Dimitri, because um, last year I went over to Japan and, you know, over here we drive on the right side of the street in the U.S. And on the escalators, everybody's on the right and on the sidewalk, everybody's on the right. So anytime I'm walking around, if somebody is on the right side walking towards me, I'd have this reaction and go, you know, you're on the wrong side of the sidewalk. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing over here, right? But then I go to Japan and I'm carrying all my stuff and everybody's on the other side of the escalator. They're on the left. You drive on the left. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my goodness, all those times people's culture might dictate where they often go. And, and I was like, oh, well, I don't need to. All of a sudden I let go of all of that. Um, it was pretty uh -huh. neat. And I remember the honking, what you were talking about, Dimitri, in, in Bali, when you're on the scooters, they honk to let you know that they're coming, not to be irritated at you for something you did wrong here in America. And so at first, when I was on the roads, it was very dissociative and very, I was so anxious all the time because there's beeping all the time. There's like, but it was just so funny that exactly to what you said, like stepping outside myself, I realized, oh my goodness, well, once, I, once I felt that that wasn't somebody getting mad at me, they were helping me, and it was a way of, of moving forward. It was so neat. But shifting, shifting gears a bit, um, uh, you talk a lot about emotional intelligence in the book, and in particular, that emotional intelligence is, is a key to living mindfully. Can you just briefly describe what you mean by uh, emotional intelligence? Uh, yes. Um, indeed, what you did in Japan was emotional intelligence. And if you were taking our workshops, you would already reach level four, which is one of the highest levels because <laughs> you already use EQ, emotional intelligence. And when we say it's the key of living mindfully from the heart, what we mean is this. It's not enough to know yourself. I mean, you have to know yourself. But yeah, you also step one. <laughs> have to know. How do, how, do you, how do you decide, how you choose, and what kind of action you take in life? So the question becomes now is, there's thousands of emotions, probably about 32,000 emotions out there, and we basically cannot even name that wheel 
has different emotions from anger to disappointment to uh, happiness and joy and all these things. And mm -hmm. this wheel, we are constantly moved day and night. We have different emotions and different intensity. So if we are in the middle of the wheel and, and, and we, we are sort of spinning that wheel, we basically make decisions. So unless we become emotional literate about the emotions and we know exactly the underlying emotions and we don't have to go out there and learn 32,000 emotions we can learn the first eight basic emotions from anger to disappointment to fear these are the strong emotions that we live every day mm. yeah. so when we learn these emotions and we learn how to navigate these emotions you remember Stephen Covey who was a very successful writer and he wrote the book on uh, He said, seek to, to really understand the other side. The guy who's beeping the horn, is he upset with something? Is there something wrong with his life? It's like stepping a little bit on his own shoes and trying to understand what's happening with this fellow. So we follow a lot of capacities in life and a lot of uh, areas unconsciously, unless we start realizing what are my uh, emotions that I use? What are the underlying emotions? What I feel? One of the things that Christina and I do a lot and mention in the book, when there's an emotion on the outside, the first thing to say sometimes, what am I feeling now? And let the emotion flow through do you. Don't block it. Mm -hmm. Don't let the anger come in. Don't let the disappointment, the fear. Most people make decisions out of instantaneous fear. What we are saying is, let it feel. And then what you do is, write down the thoughts. You might want to call your Siri and uh, write the thoughts. When somebody did something out there, don't respond instantaneously. Ask yourself, what am I thinking now? What am I feeling now? What do I want to do? Do I want to go out, out there and beat the guy up who, who uh, beat me with his horn? Or, or am I going to do something within me to step outside my ego like you did in, in, in the band and be able to see the, from a distance what's happening out there and evaluate the situation? That's EQ. EQ to us means that the ability to understand the habit, be aware of the habit, be emotionally intelligent, and be able to experience that feeling without labeling. If from the moment you label it, and the moment, and, and I don't mean label, yes, you have to label that feeling, but I don't mean following the prescribed path of fear, joy, disappointment, and so on. Before it's you being even adaptable. And, and yeah, allow it yeah, within. Yeah. And not just that, but <clears throat> emotions, <clears throat> I need water here. <laughs> emotions have levels. Mm -hmm. So understanding, as Dimitri said, the, um, the vocabulary of emotion. For instance, anger, always there's fear under anger. So when you're angry, you have to, the first thing you have to say to yourself, okay, I'm angry. What am I fearful of? That's mm. what's causing the anger. Am I, am I, am I going to lose something here? Am I going to lose some time? Am I going to lose my rightness? Am I going to lose my lover? What's going mm. on here? You know, there's usually something associated uh, with that. So it's really learn the vocabulary of the emotions and the hierarchy of emotions. And also learn the level of energy, life force energy, associated with each and every emotion. Love vibrates at 500. The universe vibrates at the same frequency as love. You know, something like um, rage and fear, they're vibrating at 20 and 30. You're really pulling your life energy mm -hmm. down. On top of all of that, every all energy has a field to it, okay? An energetic footprint, a field. So if you're angry and you focus on your anger for one hour, Travis, you have multiplied that energy field 10 times, mm. 10 times. If you focus on it for one day, 24 hours, you're going to find yourself inside a bubble of fear. It's all around you. It's not just a little cloud over your head anymore. It's completely around you. Mm -hmm. And it's harder to get out of that. So part of emotional intelligence is recognizing that you have an emotion that you need to deal with. And 
stop focusing on, you know, work with it. As Dimitri said, feel it, okay, fully in your body. Let it pass through you and it will dissipate, but don't live there. Some of us mm -hmm. tend to live there with the anger for years and years. I know someone I worked with that was angry for 38 years. And yeah. she developed all thing. these diseases in her physical body and everything because there's a correlation. When you're angry and unhappy, it's vibrating at the same vibrational frequency as your liver. So what happens mm -hmm. is this anger gets stored in the liver and the liver starts eating away at itself. And before you know it, you've got a problem with your liver or your heart or your speech or any other of your organs. Everything in the universe is connected. Everything is connected through energy. And we need to know where the connections are. So when someone says to me, you know, i got a problem with my liver, I say to them, what are you angry about? Mm -hmm. They look at me and I say, you're angry about something. Let's talk about it. And because that's a fact. <laughs> yeah. If I may, a chant on emotional sure. intelligence. I would like you to think for a moment, like a, a coal miner, that you are going into this cave to find coal or diamonds, perhaps. And if you remember a story in ancient Greek in the Knossos Palace, where Theseus, the Greek hero, went in and killed the Minotaur. And he did it in a, a way that we sort of use in the mind is the map book. He used, it was such a labyrinthical uh, cave to go in that any and the feminine power in his life suggested that, uh, look, you're going to use a string. You're going to put a string on the outside, you're going to nail it outside, and then you're going to go through in and out, in and out, until you find the minotaur, kill them, and then come out. The minotaur is the dark side within our mind. So if you recall back the earlier conversation that we started, we said that uh, habitual patterns is the first thing, then energy comes second, then we go to awareness, then we go to the inner critic, and now we are in EQ, emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Of emotional intelligence as the mark where you come in and you have now an understanding of your emotions, you know how to navigate through this tunnel of the mind, and now what you do in this case, you start asking yourself questions, consequential thinking. What are really the decisions that I'm going to make? What are the cost and benefits of my decisions? I mean, if, we, if you start weighing the cost and benefits, you are now in that uh, part of the tunnel where you can really make good decisions. And the idea is when you get to the tunnel, and we'll get later on on chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, <laughs> how all the things come into play. It's really a roadmap. The book's supposed to be taken almost like a roadmap from chapter 1 to 12. And if you skip steps, if you skip the emotional intelligence, you can easily get to the next uh, chapter and so on and so on. So it takes those steps. You really have to think as a miner that you're inside the tunnel and you have to navigate from it habitual patterns all the way to emotional intelligence. But don't do it in a painful way. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Do it with a sense of curiosity. Love yourself enough to be really curious about your life and your patterns and what happens, you know, uh, within you. What happens when, you know, the mind chatter soars so high, you know, uh, ask yourself, be gentle with yourself and be curious. Love yourself through the whole process. Yeah, thank you. And uh, as you were talking, one of the things that resonated really strongly with me is this idea that we've sort of spiritualized our emotions in a way to say that if I have something other than a loving thought, I'm doing something wrong. And so I think, obviously, the catching a laugh, because some people actually believe that their emotions should be guided by spirit and not by this programming that you describe. And so we often judge ourselves for having a bad thought or even pushing it so far away, we don't even notice we're having a negative reaction. So I love what you talk about in your book that, you know, the, our emotions are really like Abraham Hicks has talked about, you know, our emotional guidance system. They help lead the way. When a lot of people use it to ride themselves into craziness, I think if you can acknowledge 
that you're feeling anger and maybe if you don't want to feel anger set a timer for two minutes and allow yourself to be as angry as you need to be but realize that that's not the most helpful thing for you and as we're kind of coming close to the to the time that we have for the show and i just want to make sure that one as we don't have time to go through chapters 8 9 10 11 and 12 on the air you want to call us again and we'll go through we'll go through yeah step part two but I do want to make sure people know that the, the book is called The Mind is the Map, Awareness is the Compass, and Emotional Intelligence is the Key to Living Mindfully from the Heart. And again, I'm joined by uh, Dimitri and Christina. And I want to just highlight just really quickly that you also both have co-founded the Edemonia Center, which is a learning center for transformational change, core healing, and personal development. And I was caught by the name, as you could imagine. Um, could you briefly share what that means and what you do at the center a little bit? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Edemonia is an old uh, word. It was, it was used uh, a lot by Aristotle. And it's composed by two really words, EU, which is divine, like your program, divine, <laughs> and also demonia, which is the, the Greek word for demon. Now, Demon was in ancient Greek an angel. So mm -hmm. Socrates and a lot of ancient Greek philosophers believe that you always have this angel within you, an angel of happiness, an angel that makes you flourish, an, an angel that makes you excited almost to a, a point of ecstasy, but ecstasy with control ability, an ability to flourish in life and become joyous and charismatic. And, uh, and, and, and Socrates used this way. Socrates was, of course, the student of Plato, and Plato was a student of uh, Socrates. Plato and Plato was a student of Socrates and used this to create this. So when we decided to create a center, we, we really wanted people to understand that the ultimate purpose in life is happiness. I mean, you can put a lot of goals in your life, you can make a lot of money, you can, you can create a lot of empathy and compassion. Everything is wonderful and fully, and we talked to the last chapters on the book, but in reality, our purpose was to create happiness and live at happiness. A soul, at a soul level. School, mm -hmm. school. Happiness within, not happiness that depends on outside sources. Of course, people are gonna say, well, if I'm not making this money, I'm not happy, and I don't have these relationships. Well, happiness comes from within, doesn't depend on outside sources. But so that was the concept. So the school created now programs and classes, and, and 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 what our ultimate goal is to create custom classes. If somebody wants to understand about anger, they can read thousands of books and take thousands of courses. But what about a course of in anger that would be customized to you? If we understand. And, and, and do an assessment on you, and we understand the writing on the wall, your inner voice, your life, and everything. Then a particular course in anger is going to work for you, not for everybody else. So that's what Demonia does. In addition to other programs, Christina, you want. We're to the first one out there doing that, you know. And my thinking and my feeling around this is, Travis, when I've been working one-on-one -on -one with students and lecturing and clients, I speak to them personally on what their issue is. I have attended lots of seminars, lots of workshops, mm. read lots of books, and they're all over the place, but they're not really focused on what it is that I need to heal in the moment, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so what we've done at Eudaimonia is we've got hundreds of courses that um, Dimitri and I have developed over the years. I've been teaching for a long time, and we've broken them up into modules. So using some quizzes, uh, we're able to zero in on what modules would fit this individual with mm. this problem. So by the responses to the small quizzes, I think there's four or five quizzes, we go deeper and deeper and then we're able to pull these modules that speak directly to their issue. We want to give them not just one takeaway, we want to help them heal. So, right. so it's know, individualized it's for their own personalized experience. absolutely yeah. and no personalized as if i was sitting right across from you travis and working with you personalized mm -hmm. to what you have no one has done this in an online environment uh for so many at it's been a real job pulling it all together believe no, me so but how do folks find out more about this center 
Yeah, the center is really, the, the courses we just mentioned will be available to the public on June 1st. Uh, this, if you go to the mineisthemap.com, you'll be mm -hmm. able to connect to our site and then there is the Evdemonia Center that basically will host all the courses and would we'll be able to understand a lot of things. They can write to us. We, can, uh, we already uh, open up four levels that basically deal in bundles for those things. Mm -hmm. We're going to be working a series of quizzes and assessments. Before we do anything, we'll go through a four-step method in order to be able to understand what is in your mind, how your roadmap works, how you make your decisions, how well you know yourself, how you make your choices. And after we learn all this information, we'll be able to create a custom course. The courses are going to be very inexpensive, nothing. Very inexpensive. Very we much. want them affordable. You know, like I said, yeah. Christina and I do a lot of things for the joy of happiness and love, yes, and success. But at the same time, we want to be able to share our, our compassion and our empathy and love for the people so uh, we walk with you we don't talk at you you know it's really important we're active listeners that we walk with the people you know we have a forum up on the mind is the map it's a huge chat forum and a community jump in there ask us any questions about the book any questions about any of the courses that you're taking and we're right there we have five others uh who are with us on our team I have um, taught each and every one of them over the years, and my program is very, very deep. It's a four-year program, and um, these, have, these are my top graduates, and they're very excited about uh, eudaimonia. They all, have, they all have their own coaching practices, but everyone's willing to jump in on eudaimonia and assist anyone who needs help, like I help 24-7. Christina, I'm the sixth one. I'm one of your designers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you both so much uh, for joining me on the show and uh, for spending your time and sharing your incredible wisdom. And again, the book is The Mind is the Map. I look forward to seeing um, you in the future. And, um, and thank you again so much for joining me this week. Thank you for having us, Travis, for the wonderful opportunity. Love your program. Bless you so much. Me too. Thank you so much. Bless you. Thank you.